We've laid a little bit of a foundation related to critical thinking using Moore's sort of book on critical thinking in intelligence analysis, but I think that there's more to be said that will make some of the other things that we'll be doing um, in terms of intelligence analysis and some of the other videos that I have maybe fit together a little bit more, more easily and, and help maybe orient folks about the kind of skills and, and mindsets they should be bringing to the table. And for this, I'll be um, talking about this article by Noel Hendrickson, and I'm gonna pull this up sort of full screen so you can kind of get a sense of this. And I, I think this is a really interesting article. Um, Hendrickson does a couple things. Um, he talks through different types of critical thinking uh, in terms of sort of an informal deductive logic. That's one way that people approach critical thinking and teaching about critical thinking. He talks about positive mental habits as another approach that people have to thinking about critical thinking. And then finally, he introduces this taxonomy of reasoning, which I found to be really helpful and kind of organized how I think about a lot of the structured analytic techniques and other sort of advice that gets given to intelligence analysts. But Hendrickson does something else in this article that I think is really useful. He talks about how critical thinking fills a intellectual gap that's sort of been left in sort of the Western tradition of teaching reasoning that used to rely very heavily on sort of Aristotelian logic. But over the course of the 20th century, sort of problems were found with Aristotelian logic. It, it seemed to be a dated mode of, of uh, reasoning. And it was replaced by, at least among philosophers, with formal symbolic logic that was much more rooted in math, that was considered much more rigorous. But unfortunately, it was also less accessible. And what that meant is that when we go to try to teach people reasoning skills, we oftentimes don't have very good sort of frameworks to do that. And that's where critical thinking has sort of come in. It's been this sort of collection of ideas about how do we think about and how do we teach people about critical thinking. Okay, so Hendrickson then notes that those approaches or those, those attempts to teach critical thinking as a way of reasoning tend to fall into two different camps. And we actually saw this with Moore's discussion where he talked about sort of, you know, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning and abductive reasoning is sort of a bad thing. Uh, and then he sort of pivots in and talks about sort of qualities of more rigorous and, and less rigorous thinking. And that mirrors what Hendrickson is saying that there's sort of this informal deductive logic that gets taught. It's not exactly sort of the Aristotelian sort of framework, but there's sort of this idea that you should be thinking about your inferences and your assumptions that you're bringing to the table. You should be able to sort of break apart arguments and sort of figure out how they fit together. Um, you're, you're thinking about the mode of argumentation. And the second uh, approach that gets taken is these positive mental habits, right? That you should be self-aware, that you should be reflective, that you should understand that we as human beings have bias, that we should try to sort of separate ourselves out from the problem so that we can bring sort of a level of objectivity to it, uh, that we should be fair and balanced in our reasoning process. All, right, all of these are sort of mental things that we as an individual sort of bring to the table. They're not things, there are steps that we would go through to sort of build a, a rigorous argument. And Hendrickson says this is useful, but it ends up being sort of a muddle. And this is something that I've, I've really wrestled with. And the way that Hendrickson resolves this is by saying, look, there, there's a taxonomy of types of questions and different strategies and different sort of characteristics of good reasoning matter a heck of a lot more for different kinds of questions. And so Hendrickson identifies sort of four questions that are relevant to intelligence analysis. I teach US foreign policy. And so as I was going through this, I was sort of thinking about, well, actually there's additional questions uh, that, that are relevant to policymakers um, that are maybe a little bit overlapping with what intelligence analysts would bring to the table, but are distinct. And so when we're thinking about sort of intelligence analyst questions, we're thinking about what happened. We're thinking about sort of answering, why did it happen? Uh, we're thinking about two future oriented questions, right? What might happen, right? Sort of brainstorming about the future. And then also sort of a counterfactual piece of, so what could we do about it? And when we're thinking about that from a, the perspective of an intelligence analyst, we're thinking about the question about viability. What kind of strategies would actually work? Like what are the things that are, are physically and, and like practically, not practically, physically possible, we'll go with that word. Uh, but when you're a policymaker and you're thinking about that same question about 
right? What can be done? Sure, you want to select policy options that are actually doable. Um, so in terms of like the physics work and like you can actually get people where they need to go in a timely manner. But you're also thinking about like the feasibility of things, right? You're thinking about Right. Do I have the votes in Congress for this? Or how does this interface with existing law? Or what is sort of the ethical implications of this? Right. Those are policymaker questions about should we be doing this? Is this a thing that can be done? Is this a thing that's actually something that that's that's workable rather than just can we make it, you know, can we, can we execute this and will it have the effect that we think about? Um, and, and are desired, so the more viable questions. And then policymakers are also um, gonna be wrestling with that moral question about what should be done, um, balancing all those different ethical and practical and resource considerations that typically we try to separate out from sort of the, the intelligence analyst part of this equation. Okay, so what I've done um, is sort of the value added that I'm trying to bring to this is I take the taxonomy uh, that uh, Hendrickson develops, and I've sort of gone through sort of all the, the mental habits identified by Moore, and also talked about by Hendrickson, and all the structured analytic techniques that are talked about by Fearson and others, and I've tried to like organize them around these, these various different um, types of questions. So if you're interested in what actually happened, right, you're interested in deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning, you're interested in making sure that your arguments are holding together, you're interested in making sure you've asked the right questions with starbursting, uh, and you're interested in sort of evaluating your assumptions, and you're maybe interested in analysis of competing hypotheses, which is, again, it's oftentimes held up as sort of the gold standard of the most rigorous types of uh, structured analytic techniques, but interestingly, really only seems to be appropriate for this one kind of question what happened. It's less useful for those other types of questions. When we're thinking about the positive mental habits that we're bringing to the table, we want to be skeptical about evidence. We want to be accurate and think about precision. We want to be thorough, right? We're working through everything. We want to be fair-minded in terms of how we're weighing things. We want to be self-aware of our own bias, right? Those are, I think, reasonable positive mental habits to bring to the table when we're just trying to answer a basic question like, what's the state of the world right now? what has actually happened, what is existing. But when you're interested in questions about why, right, those are different kinds of questions. And to answer that from a from a, a positive mental habits perspective, you don't need to necessarily be scrutinizing sources. You need to be thinking broadly about how the world might work. Right? You might need to be thinking deeply so you come up with like full and complete explanations rather than just sort of shotgun quick and dirty, like I think I understand this and I'm moving on. Right, systematic and thorough and logical, like those are the kind of uh, positive mental habits that you want to bring to the table for those kind of problems. Similarly, when we think about sort of the the tools, the processes, the steps we might go through, the structured analytic techniques we might use, uh, it's some overlap. We're still using inductive and deductive reasoning. We're still sort of thinking about our assumptions. We're still trying to sort of figure out how things fit together and maybe evaluating the, the effectiveness of our assumptions. But there's other things that have sort of fallen by the wayside. When we start thinking about more future-oriented questions, like what could happen, um, inductive reasoning is gone. Like we're, we're back to just deductive reasoning. I think I have a theory about how the world works, so I'm gonna try to apply that, but we're up added in counterfactual reasoning, right? What would happen if I changed things, um, if something shifted? We've added in some forecasting or forward-looking things like signposting um, or alternative futures. Uh, we're trying to think about sort of the dynamic interactiveness with, with war games or with role playing. We're trying to think about a wide range of factors um, with the, the steep analysis or the social, technological, environmental, economic, and political dimensions to a problem, right? We're doing different kinds of analytic structured tasks to try to answer this different kind of question. Our thinking, like with the why question, is should still be broad, it should be deep, right? We still want logical, um, but we've added in humble that w there's a lot of complexity and things that we can't possibly know. And so we need to be aware of that and, and bring that to the table with us as we're working on these problems. When we ask the question about what can be done, again, that's sort of bending into that sort of policy focused question. Um, we might wanna add in an impact analysis uh, to our uh, you know, tools of, of uh, informal deduction. When it comes to positive mental habits, uh, again, there's sort of that that sense of being creative that's now part of that story of uh, thinking about a, a wide variety of different possibilities for how you could approach this and how things might fit together. Uh, there's an element of professional that's been added in, right? Because again, we're bending into um, policy at this point. 
and we ask our analysts to sort of separate their own policy preferences, their own political views from the analysis that they're they're providing, there's a level of professionalism that's that's expected out of an analyst in in tackling these kind of questions that doesn't exist for other kinds of questions. Okay, so what's the main takeaway from all of this? Well, I really like Hendrickson's sort of framework for organizing this, and I think that it fills an important gap in what has been written and, and work that's been done on critical thinking, which oftentimes sort of throws a variety of sort of strategies and tools at people and says, here, use these kind of things, but doesn't necessarily give guidance on what kind of problems and what kind of tools or strategies sort of map together. And I think Hendrickson's strategy hopefully does that pretty well. And I think it also works really well as sort of an organizing framework for the videos that I'm producing, which tend to be 15 minutes long and sort of introduce here's a technique or here's a bias or here's a problem. And they kind of exist sort of in the abstract and without a lot of structure. This kind of gives them structure, right? So you can sort of identify like, oh, this is a technique that can be used for thinking about why something happened. And these are the sort of the mental processes or these are the sort of the biases that come with that kind of problem. And I think that's probably a more useful way to think about these things than just sort of ass assembling a, a toolbox full of strategies and techniques. And then when you encounter a problem, sort of rifling through the toolbox, hoping that you've picked the right tool. Um, so there, there's a lot of guidance here that comes from this and I found it really useful. And I hope you have as well.